Hi, good evening, everyone. Are you able to hear me okay? Sure can, yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. I want to take a moment to welcome everyone to our monthly Driftless Dialogue series. My name is Erica Kronk, and I am the Executive Assistant at the Kickapoo Valley Reserve. Uh, this is our first time doing a virtual Driftless Dialogue. Uh, normally, these talks are attended in person, uh, but due to the weather Today, uh, we decided to switch this one to virtual. So uh, thank you to everyone for um, joining us. And just wanted to ask that any questions you have throughout the talk, if you could just post them in the chat. And then at the end of the talk, I will read them uh, to Dr. Simon Gilroy and uh, he will do his best to answer them with the amount of time that we have left. Also want to acknowledge that these Driftless Dialogue talks are made possible by a grant through the Ralph E. Newsom Reforestation Fund. And that grant is administered through the University of Wisconsin, Madison College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. And these talks are also supported by our Friends of Kickapoo Valley Reserve Group and also like to give a special thanks to Badger Talks who helped organize and coordinate uh, tonight's presenter. Before I introduce uh, Dr. Simon Gilroy, I would just like to read the Kickapoo Valley Reserve land acknowledgement statement. The Kickapoo Reserve Management Board acknowledges that the state and federal lands that comprise the reserve fall within the ancestral homelands of the First Nations people, including the Ho-Chunk Nation. We recognize the sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk and other First Nations, and we will work towards a shared future by continuing to create collaborative opportunities to protect and preserve these lands. So tonight's presenter is Dr. Simon Gilroy. Dr. Gilroy is a professor in the botany department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research is on how plants sense and respond to their environment. He works extensively with NASA on understanding how plants grow on the International Space Station and plans for using plants and life support on a planetary basis. Tonight's talk, Plants in Space, Why is there plant research on the International Space Station? Explores NASA's long history of partnering with university plant researchers to understand how plants respond to growing in space. So his talk is gonna cover some uh, of the kinds of plant research going on in space and some of the recent work from UW-Madison. So I will, um, with that, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Simon Gilroy. Well, uh, thank you. And let me just, oh, I need to be able to share my screen. Oh, there we go. And how about that? All right, so. Does that look good to everyone to be the slideshow? Yeah, that looks good. Excellent. All right. Um, well, um, I just wish I could be there in person. It seems that every time that we've tried to make the trip out to uh, Kickapoo Reserve, the weather gods have decided that we are not going to do it. So, um, yeah, wish I could be there in person, but virtual will have to do. Um, so what I thought would be kind of fun to do is talk a little bit about some of the plant research which is going on on the space station, try to set it into some kind of context of what, um, why, why we're interested in doing it, and some of the just weird stuff that happens when you get off the surface of the Earth and start to try and do stuff in space. Um, but I always have to start out by pointing out that I am the front person for a huge, huge team. Space flight is a very complicated, multifaceted sort of endeavor. And this is just the, the UW-Madison team for my lab. 
Um, and we cover a lot of different aspects of, of sort of space biology and, and space plant biology. But I should really highlight the, the spacey arc, which is that um, I'll talk a little bit, if we have enough time, about some of the, um, the avenues of research we're going down. And that's really me talking about the work of doctors Arkadipa Bakshi, Sarah Swanson, Richard Barker, Sabrina Chin. Um, we have, we're just crazy lucky to have had uh, Major Lucy White from Space Force working with us for a year. And then one of our big collaborators is uh, Ellison Blankfloor, who's at NASA Kennedy Space Center. And, but everyone on that slide, plus hundreds of other people at places like um, Kennedy, make it all happen. So I am, I just have to come clean and just say, I am fronting for an enormous number of people with an enormous amount of expertise. And it doesn't work unless everyone is sort of working together. Right. So I thought the, the cool place to start would be uh, probably the most expensive Valentine's bouquet that you will ever see. So this is uh, zinnia flowers. And you might be able to kind of get the feeling that you can see the earth behind them because that, that is a flower bouquet that was grown on the International Space Station. And the reason you can see the earth is because it is literally floating in the weightless environment of the space station in a thing called the cupola. Um, pull up my... uh, so this bit here sticking off the side of one of the modules of the space station is a thing called the cupola and the picture to the right is the, it's a classic picture that all of the uh, astronauts get which is of them looking out from the cupola and so this is sort of the earth observatory uh, part of the space station uh, it's uh, apparently the astronauts spend a tremendous amount of time in there they have a lot of time on their hands I mean they're up in space 24 seven and eventually you have to have some downtime. So they spend a lot of time looking at the earth. And what happened was one of the astronauts, Scott Kelly, ended up being able to grow zinnia plants on the space station all the way through their life cycle, got them to flower. And for Valentine's day, he made that awesome bouquet for his uh, partner. Okay. And so I just wanna try and put that into context for a while to get to think about growing plants in space um, and some of the challenges. And so um, it's gonna be possible, we're gonna be able to do it, but there's gonna be some weird stuff we're gonna have to deal with. So there is the awesome bouquet. That is a, a if you work in the field of, of plant sciences and space sciences, that is a remarkable bouquet to have been able to produce, growing it, growing those plants through their entire life cycle. And so let's, maybe spend a few minutes just trying to put it into context is why when we see that, that we go like, wow. I mean, it's still wow, because it's like plants in space. But so uh, why do plant biology in space? And there are some very significant cons to it, some significant challenges. One of them is, I mean, it's really expensive. If you think of what went into uh, getting that bouquet to getting the plants to flower in space, collecting the flowers and making a bouquet, right? That required a whole bunch of rockets. It required a space station. It required a lot of astronaut input. Um, it's a long, it's, I mean, a long way. It's about 200, 250 miles straight up is where the space station is. But to get there is really, really hard. And so growing plants in space, is is not like going to Home Depot, getting some tomato plants and growing them in your yard. This is there's going to be a very large logistical overhead to it. So it is really expensive, and it turns out it's quite complicated to do at two levels. And so one of them um, is a level of being in this weightless environment of space is a strange place to do things. And we'll talk about some of the strange parts of it because those are the really cool parts to think about. But it's also a complicated thing to do because you have to be a good gardener, right? And growing plants, part of just being successful at growing plants is being a good gardener. 
And being a good gardener in, in space turns out to be a difficult and complicated thing to do over and above the weird weightless things. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so so why, why do it? What is the goal? Um, and why is NASA and the other space agencies investing a lot of resources in plant biology? Because you can imagine, oh, I can understand why um, NASA might want to invest a lot of, of money in understanding medicine and human physiology in space. But they actually spend a pretty decent amount of money on the plant biology side of things. So there must be some reason behind it, which is um, meets the kind of goal of, of what NASA is about. So um, there's two ways that you can sort of think about it. One of them uh, is the is sort of the inspirational exploration voyage approach to space. And if you do a space science talk, you, there are just a whole bunch of just awesome quotes. And this is the one that everyone who works in the field tends to end up using, because it is kind of partly why we all want to do it. So this is a guy called Konstantin Shilkovsky. He is one of the fathers of rocketry. He lived in the early 1900s. Um, and he was instrumental in getting a lot of the technology and the ideas about how to do rocketry and how to do astronautics and things like that. Uh, and he just came up with the, the, why should you do it? Because we're humans and we're explorers quote, which is the classic, if earth is the cradle of humanity, you cannot live in a cradle forever. And one of the reasons to wanna to do it is just that drive that we have to go and explore and find out new things and get out into the universe and find out more than what's going on on the, the, um, the planet on Earth. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do that. You can do that with robotic probes, you can do it with telescopes, but there is this sort of, of just almost like primal drive to want to do it with boots on the ground, to have human beings be the explorers. And so that's one aspect of it, which is sort of the philosophical, we are explorers, now is the time to go and explore in person. But there is a very, very practical component to it as well about getting off the surface of the earth. And that is the services that plants provide. So um, on earth, plants are kind of like the basis of all of the, of the, the large terrestrial ecosystems. Um, they provide our food. They provide the oxygen we breathe. They actually are pretty good at cleaning water. You can put some pretty yucky water onto plants and they will pass it through the plant body and um, transpire it, evaporate it off as pure water. So the idea for um, why we wanna grow plants in space for long-term habitation of space is we wanna take that life support system. It's the only one we really know that works for any long period of time is the earth and transfer that biological technology, the plant biology into space. So part of it is we wanna have a system, it's called a bioregenerative life support system. It's based around biology and it, that's plants and microbes, right? but we'll talk about the plants today. And we're gonna use that to keep people alive. And so that's a, one big goal. Um, another goal is a very science oriented goal. Space is a, a very, very unique environment. It's a great laboratory to understand how biology works. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well today. Um, so getting out there and growing plants in space helps us understand plants on the earth because we can take them into an environment which is just so different from the earth that we can reveal things that they're doing on earth that we just take for granted because things like gravity is always around. And then there is another one which the more that we are working with plants and the more that astronauts are growing plants, the more it's becoming really, really clear is an important, important and might be just, this is the only rationale that we really need to do it. People like plants and think of being an astronaut and you're in this incredibly built engineered environment and it's all very artificial. And on the space station, you can look out the window of that cupola and you can see the earth but you can't get to the earth. It's worse than being in a, a submarine where in a few hours you could surface a submarine and be outdoors. In space, you're always gonna be indoors. And so some link back to the earth turns out to be an incredibly important thing for sanity. And 
people just like growing plants and the astronauts will literally fight with each other about who gets to tend the plants. So having a growing environment around you in this really sterile, uh, well, as sterile is the wrong word as we'll see in a minute, but this very built environment turns out to be a really, really big thing. And it might just be growing plants to keep people from like tearing each other apart after living together in a small room for a year, that might just be the only rationale we need. And the picture you can see um, on the, the left here, that is a plant growing in the space station. And that was literally a plant that one of the astronauts, Don Pettit, he took seeds up with him and then he grew them in Ziploc bags, right? And just because he wanted to grow plants. Um, and so, well, let's, we'll think a little bit more about um, that. Um, but the other thing which I think is really hard to get your mind around is the vast distances that we're talking about, about what space exploration is about and why you wanna carry things with you rather than launch rockets to resupply you from the earth. Um, and the distances and the speeds and all of those things about space flight are very, very hard to get your mind around because every big, every number is huge. So the distance to the moon is a quarter of a million miles. The distance to Mars when it's closest to us is about 34 million miles. And like, probably like you, I don't know. I just know those are big numbers. I don't have a feel for them. So I, I could still imagine that maybe we could fire rockets out if we had a trip that's going to Mars. Maybe we could do a resupply thing. And we could go and sort of send people to Mars and camp on Mars and constantly send them food. So to try and put it into context, uh, we could go there now. There are the, the rocketry, I mean, we already have rovers on both the moon and Mars, the space launch system, which is a huge, huge rocket that NASA has just been using, has just flown to the moon and back. So we are going back to the moon, that's gonna happen. So the, the technology to get there already exists, but you have to put it into the context of the distances to think about why biology is going to be an issue. And I was trying to think how to, to sort of get the feel for it. And what is a rapid period of time? So the blink of an eye, you know, people say, oh, it happened in the blink of an eye. That is a really rapid period of time. Turns out from, that's about 0.2 to 0.3 of a second, right? Three tenths of a second happens in a blink of an eye. If you're in a rocket, how far do you get in the blink of an eye, all right? And so we can try and put it into, make it relatable, just to think about the distances and the speeds. So rockets, um, the rockets which are gonna go to the moon and Mars are flying at about 25,000 miles an hour. And again, I don't think any of us really understands what that is other than it's really fast. How far do you get in a rocket in the blink of an eye, all right? And that maybe that'll help us see the distances that we're talking about and the time frames. So um, let's say that you were in the rocket at the moment at the visitor center, the Kickapoo Valley Visitor Center, right? How far would you get in the blink of an eye traveling in a rocket at the speeds that rockets go if they're going to go to the moon or Mars? And it turns out in the blink of an eye, you would end up in Lafarge, right? Or let's go a little bit further, right? It takes about about two hours. If I had been able to drive from Madison um, out there, it'd be about two hours. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a timer ticking down, right? From the time that I started showing you this slide to zero, we would have been in Madison, right? The, the, you're going so fast. It takes, if, if you could use a rocket, you could get to Madison in 11 seconds. So these are crazy, crazy fast speeds, all right? Now think of real missions, all right? So we're gonna take a mission to the moon and we're gonna be traveling at these amazingly high speeds. It's gonna take us 10 days to get to the moon, okay? So I could imagine that every 10 days I could send a rocket to the moon, maybe we, we call it the M&M um, &M Express, all right? So you can imagine that an astronaut gets hungry for M&Ms and you could send a rocket and you could resupply that astronaut every 10 days. And that may, might be realistic. It'd be very expensive, but it might be realistic. Right? So 
you could send resupply of food and it would take the round trip, you know, 10 days there, 10 days back. What if we were going to Mars? Turns out at these, even at these speeds, when Mars is closest to the Earth, it's going to take nine months to get there. And so it just becomes unrealistic to think that we're constantly going to be sending rockets with resupply. It will be fantastically expensive and also very unreliable. Imagine that you had to wait for your packet of M&Ms and you had to wait nine months to get one of them. So the ability to take your life support system with you becomes a big deal. And so that's, that's what the reason that we want to be able to grow plants in space. We're not yet back to the moon. Um, we're getting close in the next couple of years, there's gonna be boots on the moon, that's gonna happen. And the goal is in the foreseeable future, there's gonna be boots on Mars as well. But the place where we can begin to work out these things is here. This is the International Space Station. And this is the place that we've been super lucky to get access to um, and to work out how plants work once you begin taking them away from the surface of the earth. And the thing to, to remember is that in space, or in environments like the space station, you're in this weightless environment. But on Earth, gravity is always there and you take it for granted. And so this is a coleus plant. It's just been tipped on its side. And this is time lapse movie just to remind you that even plants use the direction of gravity to control things like the direction that they grow in. Gravity affects a lot of things and things that you might not be thinking about. And you, it's just so intrinsic to living on Earth. So for instance, I can show you some pictures. Um, this is, I just grabbed these off the, the internet, uh, but they, just because they look wrong, right? Because we know that shoots grow up and roots grow down. And this plant, it's not growing how it should be growing because plants monitor the direction of gravity and their growth is entrained to it. And now, we're gonna put them somewhere very weird where that, that force, that piece of information that they've used to, to shape how they grow is no longer gonna be there. And it's, things are just gonna get very weird, right? Uh, and you might go, but does that mean that, because biology for its entire time that it's existed has had one times gravity shaping how it works, maybe it won't work when you move into this weightless environment. Uh, and it turns out that's not true. Biology is, is just amazing. Biology can cope with tremendous amount of stuff. And so these are just a couple of pictures of, of these plants that this astronaut Don Pettit grew. He literally just took the seeds up, put them into Ziploc bags, and he made space compost. He literally took the food scraps that after they'd eaten their meals and he made a little sort of compost inside the uh, uh, Ziploc bag. He put the seeds in, he grew the plants and he, he um, Velcroed them to one of the cabin windows as a light source and they grew. Now, if this was how we grew plants to do spaceflight experimentation and try and understand what, how to grow them and what they're doing, um, I would be very embarrassed to be talking to you. Right? But that's not how it works. All right, so this is an example of one of the growth chambers. This is on the space station at the moment. This is um, like the Cadillac of, of plant growth facilities. This is a thing called the Advanced Plant Habitat. And you can see on the left-hand side, there's one of our gardeners. That's one of the astronauts. He's a very expensive gardener. Uh, this is an awesome guy called Mark van der Heij. And he is reading the instructions about growing the, the plants inside this chamber. The, the way to think about this chamber is imagine a cube about two feet by two feet by two feet, and the top of it is LED lights. And it's, it's just really cleverly designed and it, it's got lots of cameras and lots of sensors and it controls the environment and it will monitor that and change the CO2 levels. It's a really, really high-end way of growing plants and being able to monitor what they're doing. And I'm gonna show you a movie now on the left, on the right hand side, this is uh, a recent experiment. This is actually done uh, out of the University of Louisiana, a, a researcher called Carl Hasenstein, and this is radishes, but this is literally watching them grow on the space station in this advanced plant habitat. And they grow pretty well. I mean, they, you get big plants out of them. Uh, they will form the, the edible part of the radish. Uh, but there is some issues there. And if you're a gardener and we're looking at that, you can go like, oh, you know, there's some weird stuff I see. 
So if you look at the leaves, you'll see, I always get asked this question, there are holes in the leaves, right? You can see those little black rings, those are holes. Is that insect damage? So there are no insect pests on the space station, right? What that is, is that the researchers have been taking samples of the leaves to do biochemical assays with them, right? But if you look elsewhere, um, you can see uh, like the, some of the leaves are looking purple. And if you're a gardener, you know that's, that's a sign of stress. That, those plants are not super happy. Some of the edges of some of the leaves you can see look burnt, right? And so there's something bad going on there. And if you look at the plants, they're all different sizes. It's not very uniform growth. There's some tiny plants and some big plants. So the plants are growing, they're productive, but there's other things going on. Um, here is another growth facility, which is on the space station. So on the left, that is an astronaut, Christina Koch, and she is working th with a same kind of deal, two foot by two foot by two foot with LED lights at the top. This is a piece of equipment that we really like to use. This is the vegetable production unit, or colloquially we call it the veggie. Um, and same kind of deal. It, it's a little bit simpler. The, um, the thing that Christina is holding down is the thing which is basically a shower curtain and you lift it up and that isolates your plants uh, sort of inside the shower curtain. And on the right is actually one of our experiments on the space station that hand that you can see is an astronaut Scott Tingle and he is holding the these the shower curtain down so that we can see where our plants are growing they're growing inside petri dishes because this is a sciencey oriented experiment not a vegetable production experiment and we'll come back to the results from this just you know towards the end of today's um, talk all right so we got good growth facilities we can grow plants pretty well in space um, but it's weird this, it's it's not it's not the easy gardening place that you would hope it would be, um, and so this is what it's like being in space. This is an astronaut, Jeff Williams. He's doing what the astronauts do, floating around weightless, right? Uh, it's kind of cool. Jeff Williams from Wisconsin, one of the six Wisconsin astronauts. Um, um, uh, one of the other ones you probably heard of, James Lovell. He was the Houston. We have a problem, uh, astronaut. Uh, he was a UW Madison alumni. So, so we have our people up there. So the people are going to be good. But if you look at uh, Jeff, he's floating around. That's, you know, that's what we think weightlessness should be like. That is changing how Jeff Williams biology is working. And here's some great ways to think about it. So this is uh, astronaut Karen Nyberg. She's on a treadmill on the space station. She's working out to try and ameliorate some of the problems that you get when you're in space. So because you don't weigh anything, you're not constantly fighting against gravity, it changes how your biology works relative to fighting against gravity constantly on Earth. So you lose muscle mass, you lose bone mass, and your heart still thinks it's pumping against gravity, but it isn't. So it pumps more blood to your head. So your head swells up, right? It's kind of, but you know, the countermeasures are lots of exercise, like a couple of hours of exercise every single day to try and constantly replenish the forces which are causing like your bones to be maintained and your muscles to be maintained. So that's a big thing for, um, for human biology in space. Uh, one of the, the astronauts, Don Pettit, has this great line where he says, you know, biology just gets lazy in space. It's too easy. So human biology gets lazy. Plant biology turns out gets lazy. And I'm just showing you on the right that plants respond to the mechanical forces in the world just like we do. And so plants weigh something. And so they're constantly supporting themselves against their own weight. If the wind is blowing, they support themselves against the forces of the wind. All of that disappears when you go into space. And so just like we, if we were in space, we'll be losing our bones and our muscles, our support machinery. Plants become less woody when they're in space and they lose all of the strength things because they just don't need it and the biology becomes lazy. Uh, and so if you're big organisms like um, uh, humans and plants when you're growing in space, this weightless thing becomes a really important element. But there's a lot of other things that go on in space. Um, things that affect even the microbes in space. And so, for instance, there's much higher radiation when you get further away from the Earth's protection. 
Uh, that's a biggie. That is one that um, NASA and we are researching at the moment. And it's a big unknown about what happens as far as biology and radiation exposure once you get outside the Earth's protection. But there's a lot of other things going on. Um, and we should kind of set the scene for what it's like being in the space station to think about these other things. All right. So if you're a sci-fi person, there are two views of space future. One of them is Star Trek and one of them is Star Wars. Star Trekky stuff is on the left, is beautiful, clean, it's spacecraft that just well, and they're just oh, it's just really nicely laid out. And the Star Warsy version of the future is on the right, and that is the trash compactor. It is dirty, oh, it's just like oh, there's just stuff everywhere. So the reality of the space station is it is way more Star Warsy than it is Star Trekky. People have been living in it for decades and they haven't been able to clean it very well, right? There's, yeah, how do you clean it? Eh? And so there's a lot of microbes, a lot of bacteria up there. Um, and so you remember those zinnias that were, were that um, the astronaut Scott Tingle was tending? This is actually what those zinnias looked like before he took over to become a good gardener for them. Uh, and if you look at this, this is looking down uh, this is the veggie equipment. It's got the zinnias growing in it. There are six pots of them. We're looking down at the top of them. And you don't have to be a great gardener to go, you know, five of them don't look very happy. Uh, one of them maybe is okay, but five of them, two of them are dead, right? And the other three, oh, and if you zoom in and look at them and you're a plant biologist, you can start to look at them and go like, yeah, you know, that is super stressed out. It's got curled up leaves. Um, there are, I can make plants look like that on Earth. And one of the ways I can do that is flood the soil that they're in. And we'll come back to that because that's probably what's going on here. But what, what happened, the reason those plants started to die is there are so many microbes on the space station because it's it, people are up there. It's a dirty place. That the plants became stressed out and then pathogenic microbes took over and started to kill them. And so what Scott Kelly did in order to get his flowers is he just became a good gardener. He just went in and went, I'm going to just tend these plants very carefully. So he, this is him literally with sterile sanitizing wipes. He literally cleaned off every leaf every day to get rid of the, the pathogens which were on there. And he very carefully controlled the amount of water. And he just did really, really careful gardening and he got them to flower. So it's not that the plants can't do all of their stuff in space. It's just that you've got to be a good gardener and you've got to deal with some of the weird stuff that happens. So that's how he got this bouquet. He dealt with some of the gardening aspects of it, like watering correctly and stopping pathogens. He also had to deal with some of the stuff that you may not think about that is going to happen in space. I'll tell you a few things which are going to be screwed up in those plants. And I think these are all things that when somebody tells you they're going to happen in space, you can go, oh, yeah. But I don't think you might guess them, right? They're, there's these sort of things that, that people have stumbled across and you just go like, oh, yeah, that is going to have a big impact. So let's just look at uh, like maybe three of them, all right? So one of them is that biology has very, very distinct biological clocks that make it work. So we all work on about a 24 hour cycle and we go to bed and we wake up and we go to bed and we wake up. And you all know, you know, about when you would pull all nighters or your sleep is disrupted and you just don't work very well the next day, right? So let me put into context what it's like being on the space station. So what I've done is I've made a movie of four hours of being on the space station, looking out the window, right? So there is sunrise in the morning, and there is sunset, so that's nighttime. Right? But now there's another sunrise, and there's going to be another sunset because the space station orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. So there's a sunrise and sunset every 90 minutes. So you lose the 24 hours, and it's like not sleeping well. And so here's the classic picture of this. This is astronaut Rex Walheim, who's doing a spacewalk. Spacewalks are incredibly dangerous. Right? You can't make a mistake. Astronauts practice. They choreograph the 
spacewalks they're going to do on the ground, literally for years. And they put on the spacesuit and they practice in the spacesuit and they have a buddy. And when they're in putting the spacesuit on, they have a buddy who checks all of the spacesuit because if anything goes wrong, you are not going to come back. Right? And so this is Rex outside. This is when they were building the Columbus module on the space station. And remember, he spent hours practicing this and he spent hours putting his spacesuit on and he had people helping him and checking him. And if you look carefully enough, you can notice he put his boots on the wrong feet. And that is just what happens when your sleep is just screwed up and your biological rhythms don't fit the sunrise and sunset and you just can't escape it. And it just slowly wears you down. And you might go, okay, I can understand that for human beings because we obviously have this 24 hour clock and this would be like not having good sleep for months and months and months. But what about plants? Right? So here's one of my favorite movies. This is back on Earth. This is a sunflower. This sunflower does a thing called solar tracking. So the leaves point towards the sun. And this is just going to be time lapse. And what you're going to see is the sun is rising. It's up on the right hand side of your screen. It's going to go overhead and the sunset is going to occur on the left hand side of the screen. And you should expect the leaves to track the direction of the sun because that sunflower is monitoring the sun. The sun is going to go down. Once it's gone down, just keep paying attention about what happens. All right. So there's the leaves orienting themselves to the sun to make the optimal amount use of that sunlight for photosynthesis. And you'll see the shadows moving in the background as the sun's moving. So the leaves sort of tip over to follow the sun. All right. And then the sunset occurs and the leaves. Oh, wow, that was tough, right? So whew, keep watching. The sun has not yet risen. But the sunflower predicts the timing and the direction that the sun is going to come up. There's a clock built into the plants every bit as much as there is in, in, in us as humans. And when it gets screwed up, the plants get screwed up just like the humans get screwed up. So the change in day length and the constant sunrise and sunset has effects on the plants. Um, here's another one that you might not think about, but turns out to be a really, really major issue in spaceflight. Gases move in a different way in space than they do on Earth because gas movement is driven by gravity. And you might not think about it, but let's think about convection. So this is a, a movie. This is a guy striking a match. This is done with a thing called Schlieren photography. Schlieren photography lets you see the density differences in the air. What it effectively lets you see is hot air. So we'll strike, he'll start striking the match, and you will see the hot air start rising away from the, the match, right? Because hot air rises. Why does hot air rise? Because as it gets hotter, the air expands, it becomes less dense, and it floats upwards by buoyancy. Right? It's less dense, so it's moving upwards. But in space, density doesn't count. Right? So the fact that the air is hot and should be rising up by convection is not going to occur in space. And that movement of air by temperature is everywhere. So the shape of this um, uh, candle flame is driven by gravity because it's driven by convection. The lighter hot air is rising upwards, right? And that drags the flame upwards. So what does a flame look like in space then, right? Well, there's gonna be no convection. Hot air is not gonna rise. And so this is a flame in space. It forms a sphere, right? And then it does some weird stuff that even the physicists are having a hard time working out. It's doing this thing, which is called the jellyfish. And so it does the jellyfish and then it goes, and it's using up all of the fuel it's got and then, and then, and disappears. So gases are going to move in a very different way in space than they do on the Earth. And it has effects. And so, for instance, top left-hand corner here is a piece of equipment that we've been using called the Advanced Biological Research System. And it's just a way of growing plants in plates. There it, you switch the lights on and a fan starts running. Right, And the reason you have to have the fan is because Imagine that you switch the lights on and the energy of the light is now hitting the leaf. That leaf starts to heat up. On Earth, the hot air around the leaf now 
rises away by convection, taking some of that heat away. So you are cooling yourself down by the hot air rising away from the leaf. That doesn't occur in space. So if you switch on the lights, you cook the leaf. You have to have a fan to blow the hot air away. And what turned out for in the, um, the advanced biological research system, Avers, the fan broke and it literally cooked people's plants. And it, it's so fundamental to how you use these pieces of equipment to move the air around that because the fan was broken, the Abers, the Advanced Biological Research System, was retired. It was literally dismantled and taken off the space station because you just can't use it because you don't have a way of cooling your plants down. It's, there's just a whole bunch of weird stuff. Um, it has really weird effects. If you cook, you can bake cookies in space, right? Uh, if you bake cookies on the earth, you put them in the oven, you bake the cookies, 10 minutes later, you pull out the cookies, you have cooked cookies. Right. But part of the way that the heat was being distributed in that oven and around and within the cookies was by convective movement of, of heat. So this is um, an astronaut, Luca Palmitano, and he is using an oven in space to bake space chocolate chip cookies. Right. And he had to do it four or five times. Right. And it goes in and the, uh, the oven is about the right temperature as it would be on Earth. It turned out that rather than 10 minutes, it took two hours to cook the cookies because the heat's not being distributed through the cookies, right? So it changes a lot of things that you might not think about once you start having these physical effects of the lack of gravity. What do those chocolate chip cookies taste like? No one knows because NASA would not let anyone eat them. Oh. Um, I just thought it might be cool also to show you the astronauts making spinach to eat, right? This is dehydrated spinach. This is them injecting hot water into the spinach, right, to heat up the spinach. They want to cook the spinach. This is them cooking the spinach. Then they mush it around to get the hot water distributed. That is literally their food. So you can imagine fresh food that you grew yourself suddenly becomes a really, really big deal. Uh, the last one I want to talk about, which is kind of weird in space, not weird, it's really, really like it's a, th this turns out to be the biggie. And this is super fascinating. Water is going to move in space in a different way to the way it moves on Earth. And it's going to make watering plants the big unsolved issue for space plant biology and the one that we've been working on for a, a long time. Water on Earth just falls down because gravity pulls it down. And if you have a picture in your mind of water flowing on Earth, you are almost certainly thinking of something which is being driven by gravity. Now we're going to move into space, right? And this, this is a great example of water not doing what you're expecting when it's in space. This is an astronaut, Chris Hadfield, um, and he has a washcloth and it's saturated with water. And he is literally just going to wring it out, right? And you imagine that he was on Earth, he would wring it out and the water would fall out of the washcloth, be pulled out of the washcloth, it would fall down and his feet would get wet. But this is in a weightless environment. And so there's him wringing it out, but the water doesn't get pulled down because there is, it's a weightless environment, right? And so the other forces that make water move take over. And so surface tension is a big thing for water and capillary forces, and molecules of water sticking together become a big deal. So it makes this tube of water that sticks to itself. And if you look at his hands, they look like they have a glove of water on them, right? And that's the water creeping by capillary forces over his hand and sticking to his hand. So that is how water moves in space. So if you have a watering can and turn it on its side, first of all, nothing comes out. The water doesn't flow out of it because there's no gravity to pull the water out. And the water that is in there wants to stick to things. And so for plants, it wants to stick to the plants. And so it's almost like when you water plants in space, you're doing this, which is a flooded field um, in Wisconsin, right? The water is just everywhere. And the big issue when you flood plants is that they don't have access to oxygen and they drown under those circumstances. 
just like we as humans drown. We run out of oxygen and you die because you run out of energy. You don't have oxygen to burn fuel to stay alive. Um, so this is the biggie. This is the one that no one has solved yet. How do you water plants in space? And there's two ways to approach it. One of them is an, as an engineer and work out how to make a clever growth system that doesn't allow the water to stick to the plants. And there's a big, big effort going down that route. But I'm a biologist and I, I have another way of thinking about it, which is that plants do have the capacity to live in flooded conditions for a period of time, not forever, right? There, there are some water plants, but for most plants, they don't die immediately when they're flooded. They'll hang around for many, many days. They'll just slowly peter out. Right? And so just to give you one piece of science and sort of some of the work that we're doing with NASA, right? How can we use that idea that plants have some kind of ability to deal with being flooded to work out how to adapt them to growing in space? Right? And so I just have to tell you one piece of sciencey stuff, right? which is there are different kinds of flooding, right? So I can have a plant growing in the soil and there's air in the soil and the roots are happy and everything's fine and the plant's growing well. And that will be an unflooded plant, right? There's a kind of flooding where the water just comes up and completely fills the soil. And we would call that waterlogging. The leaves are out, the leaves are able to do all the leafy things, but the root system is underwater and very unhappy. And then there is total submergence where the whole plant is underwater. Total submergence is really, really hard for plants to deal with. But plants do have the capacity to live in a waterlogged environment for actually longer than you might imagine, for many days. Um, maybe even weeks. So well, we're going to take that idea and we're going to grow plants in a waterlogged environment. And so just to show you, um, we'll get to back to space in just one minute. All right. So here we have two plants. The top, we're looking down on the rosette of the plant. The top plant is grown under perfectly unflooded conditions. It's very happy. It's a plant called mouse eared cress, which is the, the sort of the lab rat of plant biology, right? So this is an experimental system. We're just growing it under optimum conditions. The plant is pretty happy. The bottom plant, we have waterlogged its soil for four weeks. The plant's still alive, but it's tiny. It couldn't grow very well. It's dark purple, which is one of those characteristics of stress. Remember when we talked about the radishes right at the beginning? It's one of the things that tells you the plant's unhappy, right? But the plant is clearly really unhappy. It's tiny. Um, and if we grow it for very much longer under these waterlogged conditions, it is just going to die, right? We know a little bit about the machinery, the biochemistry that plants use to deal with these sort of environments. How do they know they're flooded? We know some of the genes involved. And so we've been able to target one of those genes. It's a gene called CAX2, which doesn't really matter what it is, but it's part of the sensing system that plants have that allows them to know that they're being flooded. And we've been able to take that gene and tweak it. And actually we've switched it off. And it turns out that when you switch off this particular sensing gene, it's not the plants don't respond to being flooded, it's just they cope with it so much better. And what, what we know that we've done with the engineering is we've basically made the plants constantly think they're flooded. They're really prepared for it, right? As soon as they germinate and start growing, they switch on all of their defenses against being flooded, which means they're just much more able to cope with being flooded. So we have these genetically engineered plants where we've targeted the flooding response. The prediction is, well, the question is, do these work in space then? Because maybe we've got a biological way around the flooding issue. And so this is just the one piece of science I want to show you. This is one result from an uh, experiment we've done on the space station. This is growing those engineered plants. And we've, we grow them in our Petri dish system, but we can follow how they grow and we can see how the root system grows. The ones on the left were grown at Kennedy Space Center on the ground with one times gravity. The ones on the right were grown in the space station. And take home is like the ones on the right, the roots don't know where to go, grow, right? Because they've got no gravity to tell them where to go. So they don't know to grow down. 
But if we characterize what the root system looks like and we add up all the amount of roots that they produce and we work out how many shoots they produce and how big the leaves are, these plants grow just as well in space as they do on the ground. And so this is a big effort now to try and engineer plants because plants have evolved on the ground in the terrestrial world with one times gravity. They've never had to deal with this other weird world and so now as a biologist, our part of this whole effort is to engineer the plants to cope with the stresses that they're going to get in this weird weightless world. Um, so I think I should end up with um, one last quote, because um, there's just too many of the good ones from for spaceflight. So we're playing with the space station as a laboratory to work out how to do plant biology away from the, the surface of the earth. One of the goals is Mars. And I think it's realistic to think there will be humans on Mars in the foreseeable future, not next year, a couple of decades time, it's perfectly logical that we will be able to get there. And so we'll end up with a quote from Elon Musk, which is just super fun, which is, I'd like to die on Mars, just not on impact. Um, and with that, I think I should stop and stop sharing my screen and just see ooh, if I can do it. If anyone has any questions. Uh, All right. Yep. So, yep. any questions you have, fire away. Um, the wackier, the better. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say that was a um, fantastic presentation. Thank Very um, just insightful and pretty fascinating what's happening up there. I love the representation from Wisconsin in space. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, I, I don't know if any of you know, um, in Sparta, there is the Deke Slayton Museum. Uh, and Deke was one of the Wisconsin astronauts. And they have a big, like one of those things where it's remarkable that it is where it is. It's a big museum. It's got lots of space memorabilia, a lot of stuff um, that, that you would think should be in a really big city. And it's literally in Sparta, Wisconsin. And it is very, very cool. They run a um, space camp for kids. And so every summer they bring in a bunch of, of um uh, K through 12 and just do a whole bunch of spacey stuff. And you you just, you don't realize how big an impact Wisconsin has on the space world until you sort of get into it. Um, so for instance, the um, two growth facilities that I talked about, the advanced plant habitat and the veggie, those are both designed and built in Middleton. And there's a company that used to be called Orbitec and now is Sierra Space. And they are literally the world leaders in building the plant biology stuff for growing things in space. Yeah, so there's a tremendous amount that's going on. It's just you don't know it until sort of you know it. Yeah, that's amazing. And I saw John put in the chat that uh, two people from the Driftless region too. Um, mm. Very cool. Yeah, and the thing I always say now is it always has been up until now that if you wanted to be an astronaut, you kind of have to be a jet jockey, right? It, the, the astronauts were generally drawn from things like fighter pilots and military background and things like that. And, um, you know, they were, they, they are, they are still are, they are super cool people. When you meet them, they're just very normal people, except they have this amazing job. Um, but now it truly is that because the access to space is getting so much easier and there are so many commercial ways to get to space, that the astronaut core is changing and the astronaut core is turning into normal people. You don't have to be a fighter pilot to be an astronaut now. The people who are being trained as astronauts for the next round of astronauts are people who have skills that you need other than how to fly a rocket. 
And so I always go like to whenever you, you talk to someone who, who has dreams of being an astronaut and thinks that it's just unrealistic, it is not unrealistic anymore. You just have to put your mind to it. And there's more and more regular people who are going to be astronauts. And it's just so awesome to see it happening. Yeah, I also thought that flower bouquet, the zinnias, that was yeah. incredible. You, so one question which is, always comes up is, why zinnias? Why did they start growing zinnias in space? It just seems very random. And so it's a great insight into how it all works. So the, the NASA off, um, person who's um, designed that experiment really works on food crops. So she works on lettuce and things like that. And her experiments on the space station are about growing things like cabbages and lettuce to do what you would think to have food. Uh, and um, so it turns out the astronauts sometimes eat the experiments. So she just goes, zinnias, I'm going to fly zinnias. Right? Um, no one's going to eat the flowers. And so that's why the zinnias were up there. But the hilarious thing is, so she sets all her experiments up, designs it, gets it on the rocket, it launches. And one of her colleagues the next day puts on her, on her desk a book called The Zinnia Cookbook. And it's recipes using zinnia. It was hilarious. <laughs> Love it. So it looks like we do have a couple questions here. Um, let's see. So uh, Johanna asks, um, she says, thank you. This has been great. And what do you want to study next in your lab? OK, um, so we actually have two spaceflight experiments, which um, hopefully we'll be flying this year. Um, which again, it's, we're just remarkably lucky. It just do doesn't normally happen, but we have to. They are both approaching the question of, um, so we now know that we can grow plants and we're getting better and better at growing plants and the, the community is working out the equipment and how to do it. One of the big unknowns is because it's not a sterile environment and space flight is never gonna be a sterile environment. There are lots of microbes around. What's the inter, how the plant interaction with microbes work? And there are two, two kinds of interactions. There's very positive interactions where the microbes interact with the plants and help the plants grow. And then there are uh, pathogenic interactions where the microbes infect the plant and try and kill it. And so those are the two big questions that we have at the moment. So we actually have an experiment with uh, tomato plants that we're gonna fly hopefully in uh, June, July time, where we are in inoculating a beneficial fungus with the tomato plants and growing that in space with the idea that the beneficial fungus will help the plant get around some of these issues that they have in growing in space. And then we have another uh, experiment, which I really hope that we get to do at the end of the year, where we are basically going to add pathogens to the plant and ask, are you so screwed up in space that you can't defend yourself? If that was true, that would be a very, very big deal, because we would then have to begin to think about how do we protect plants in space much, much more than we do on the ground. And so we have those two going, and, and I, yeah, yeah, we'll hopefully have some answers for those by the end of the year. We also have a question from John who asked, um, if you were designing a garden for Mars, what plants would you include? Oh, excellent question. Because <laughs> you know, like the, there was, you know, there was one period of time when being a botanist was really cool which was immediately after they released the movie, The Martian. Um, and like our standing went up for uh, like a month. Um, but so the, on The Martian, um, the, the crops are things like potatoes, right? um, which is not crazy. Um, if, you, if you want a garden to provide food, then at the moment, the targets that we have are either foods that um, where the biomass that you eat, the amount of plant that you eat is basically everything you're growing. So you don't waste anything. Um, and so a lot of the, the thought now is towards things, leafy greens, cabbages, lettuces, uh, things where you eat most of the plants. So radishes turns out to be pretty good because you can eat radish greens and you can eat the, the radish bulb. 
Um, so that area is partly what you would do. And then there's partly ones that you would target, I think, because of nutritional requirements. And so things like sweet potatoes turn out to be really good and sort of a broad um, set of nutrients. Um, there, um, there's things like, which might sound a little crazy when I first say them, um, things like blueberry plants and strawberry plants, which you would go like, that sounds like kind of a luxury. And it doesn't that break the rule of eating most of what you're growing. Um, but one of the big deals and one of the things that everyone is very not worried about, but kind of worried about, but interested in, because we don't really understand what's going to happen is radiation exposure. And on the earth, we are protected from radiation by the magnetic field of the earth that deflects the radiation around us. So once we get outside the earth's magnetic field, radiation dosage from the background cosmic rays goes up tremendously. And Mars has no magnetic field. So you are not protected in the same way when you're on Mars. So we are assuming at the moment, radiation is gonna be a big damaging part of biology on Mars. Um, and so again, there are multiple ways to think about how you're gonna deal with that. One of them would be build shields, like live underground. That's the engineering approach. The biologist's approach is human biology has the ability to repair that kind of damage. And what you want, the damage, the chemistry of that damage is oxidative damage. And so what you want is a diet high in antioxidants. And it turns out that blueberries and strawberries are fantastic antioxidant fruits. And so it's the classic thing. You want to stay healthy. Fresh fruits and vegetables is the way to go. Um, and then I think the last part of the, the thing that I would be growing, I would be growing the plants that if it was me who was living there, that I just like, and they have no role other than I just like the plants. So, um, you know, flowers, lilies, all of the gorgeous plants. I think that thing about plants bringing sanity is probably much, much more important that we're giving it credit for at the moment. And just having a beautiful garden might be the thing that, that might be keeping you way more alive than growing the food. Because um, at least you can supply food every so often with a rocket, but you can't supply feeling good with a rocket. All right, I don't see any more um, questions in the chat. Somebody else just wanted to say thank you though. Um, very oh, I'm, interesting. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it is, so, it is such a strange place um, that where things that you just rely on just don't work anymore. It's just, yeah, it's a crazy place. It's an awesome place to work as well. Well, thank you. Thank you for all the work that you and your colleagues are doing with this research. It's, it's really incredible. Um, and appreciate your time tonight too and um, just all your expertise it's really impressive well, I'm glad I finally got to actually talk to you guys <laughs> yeah. I, I, I promise if I am going to go into your area I will let you all know so that you can like get all the supplies in get your snow shovels ready <laughs> even if it's July <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, please do. Um, and just really quickly, too, I wanted to mention um, our next Driftless Dialogue talk um, that's scheduled for Saturday, March 18th. Um, this one's at 11 a.m. Um, and we are going to be welcoming Scott Spoolman, um, who has been with us before. And this time he's going to be presenting on the ancient history of lakes, rivers and waterfalls. Um, so this will be an in-person talk, um, assuming the weather cooperates. So. Again, just thank you so much, Dr. No, Gilbert. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you to everybody who joined us. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Erica. That was great. Good to Zoom with you. Yeah, you as well, John. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> good night. Good night.